Welcome back everyone to Lead the Standard. I am Kelly Taylor and today we are up to episode 25 using ISO 45001 systems approach for muscular skeletal injury prevention. Ugh, tongue twister. Um, I am here with my co-host Jackie Stapleton. As always, Jackie, great to have you with us. Thank um, you. I do feel it's very obvious that today is going to be equal parts educational and entertaining. It started off that way. Did you want to say musculoskeletal again? No, not really, but I have to, so we'll get there in the end. Please enjoy, everybody. (laughs) I am going to lead off with the educational part. That was the plan, but clearly we've gone for entertainment. So today... (laughs) We are focusing, as I said, on how the ISO 45001 systems approach can be applied to musculoskeletal disorders or MSDs, and I'm going to use that for the rest of the day, Um, not just through policies, but through proactive measures um, like better better ergonomics, regular assessments, and of course, continual improvement. Jackie is going to break down each of those elements, um, leadership, planning, support, and evaluation, and share with us how these work together to reduce those MSD risks. Okay, Jackie, deep breath. (laughs) This episode is all about preventing one of those most common workplace injuries, and it's going to make me say it again, musculoskeletal (laughs) disorders. Now, I know we've both got some entertaining um, I'm going to call it and personal stories relating to MSDs which I'm sure will somehow manage to integrate themselves into this episode but firstly (laughs) would you like to elaborate a little bit more on what I've already alluded to so far yeah so of course as usual um, you um, encouraged me to to write an article around around this, um, which of course comes into our podcast. And look, I was sitting here thinking, it's it sort of I maybe I feel a little bit bad about it, but here at Atoll, like it is a relatively low risk environment. So for us to be talking about musculoskeletal injuries. Yeah, I I don't want to, you know, say, oh, you know, we're in this high risk environment, blah, blah, blah. I mm. I get it, but I like to, you know, I reflect back on what we do know and share it. And and look, um, actually now that I think about it, what was it? I was I was following, I was at the gym this morning and I'm following a mobility coach. I can't remember what his Instagram is. I think his name's George. <laughs> he's in he's in Germany. It is now. It is now. Um, and now I should I he had a um his whole mobility um program and his Instagram account is about uh, targeting um desk dwellers. That's what he called it. Desk dwellers. So, you know, we we're sitting at our desks for a large amount of the day. And so for desk dwellers, it's our hips and lower back. And he's got some great little, oh, maybe I'll find it, Kelly, and you can put it in your, mm. your notes and what his Absolutely. Instagram is um, and website. Um, everything's delivered in English, even though he's from Germany. So it's really nice at you know, helping with your hips and your lower back mobility because as he's coined it we're desk dwellers so that's sort of where I started off you know talking about these MSDs from something that I experience and I know so you know it's been happening over the past few years obviously back and hips um for me, it means remedial massage. Um, oh, it impacts your shoulders as well mm. because we're sitting, yeah, we're sitting at our desk and hunching over. I know the other day I was at my desk and my son came in and he just came and he grabbed my shoulders and he pulled them back. Like I didn't even know I was sitting like that because, you know, you're at the keyboard. and So it's also your shoulders which gets to your neck. Um, something else um, I've invested in uh, just this year as a stand-up desk. So 
Um, at the moment I'm sitting, but I can just go buzz and um, it's up and I can I can stand. So I probably, I don't know about you, Kelly, but I reckon I still probably sit 60% of the day, but there's a good portion of it that I'm standing. Um, yeah. And I think the difference is I actually, when I am sitting, it's actually a stool. So, Same. yeah, I actually I've pushed my office chair out. It's not even in my office anymore. So the stool is more of a you sort of leaning in it. Your legs are still a bit longer, so your hips are extended more. Um, mm-hmm. I actually find it, and I tried it just before I pushed my office chair out, uh, you know, probably a month ago. I sat at my desk and it felt really weird. Yeah, I absolutely relate I did the same thing I tend I'm standing now because I'm I'm a fidgeter um but also for me I stand for I now make a point of standing for meetings and then I yes. sit for the heavy works so yes yeah, yeah that's I feel much more natural and comfortable into. doing that because it's more yeah. more like yeah, being in a real conversation yeah, yeah, my physio, and my physio is very happy with me now that I have a standing desk. Um, yeah. yeah, we cut back how often yeah. I see her, so she's probably yeah. not as happy and with I, me. <laughs> I actually do find that my back loosens up um, when I'm standing, hmm. it, and it's purely, you know, obviously, you know, I go for a walk every day, and I go to the gym and do those mobility mobility exercises, and standing actually helps to loosen it so i suppose yeah understanding what what these risks are in your own workplace and as i said look i totally get there's workplaces out there that have much higher risk but i would i and i should find some stats on it but desk dwellers which i love the term that he's coined um it's it's got to be a large percentage of our working population are desk mm. dwellers. So it's a it's a huge thing that we have to be aware of. Um, and you mentioned ergonomics before as well. So that sort of reminded me something else that we do here is because um, we all work from our home offices, we conduct self-risk um, assessments on our workstations, how they're set up, where how our monitors are set up, our chairs and so on, um, and photos are taken as a part of that. So that's done at least annually or obviously if someone relocates even houses or just decides to set up a new workstation somewhere else or gets a new desk, a new chair or, or whatever, if something changes, obviously. And obviously if, if there's if an incident's occurred, um, it's it's redone and revisited. So, you know, by doing that, we've, I was going to say, we've got an opportunity to pick up potential issues, but I think because the, the, the worker actually does it for themselves, it helps them to be aware of it as well um, and really take a look at yeah, how, how things are set up. And then, of course, we get those completed risk assessments and if there's anything to action, we take it from there. You made a good point the other day, Kelly. I think you were talking to me about your risk assessment for your home yeah. office, which, which we can see there. And yep, um, oh, that, bo- that, that yeah. bowling, the, the pin that comes in handy, I'm guessing. It wasn't there last week. It is now. <laughs> <laughs> Not for bowling, it's for laser tech. Um, but anyway. Oh, okay, um, okay. Champion. Um, but, yeah, last week I, I mentioned how while I am very aware of my workspace, um, I had already forgotten that I had put that there, but Jackie noticed it. So perfect example. Um, I get my other half to do a walkthrough after I've done my risk assessment because he is much more aware of my, our surroundings than I am. And he picks up little things um, that I may have just overlooked because they are my everyday. Like we all were talking last week again as well about our teenage boys, how they can have something on the floor and just step over it. And it could live there for 
18 months until mum comes and cleans it up. But um, exactly. yeah, having a second set of eyes certainly does help with that. Exactly. Um, I'm just moving some stuff around on my screen. It's all right. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's get into your MSD systems approach. I'm really excited oh, about yes. that, which sounds so nerdy. Yes. But, yeah, there were some really interesting <laughs> things in the article, so I want to talk more about those. No, it's all right. So it is a good segue into into that um, because, obviously, you know, we talk about, well, you know, what, what does this mean to us and, and potentially others? And then so what's the solution? And obviously because it's around um, musculoskeletal injuries, um, the focus was on ISO 45001. Um, and, look, I know the last, I think at the last four weeks this has been our focus and I feel like sometimes I'm repeating myself, but maybe this last one, I think this is the last one of this, this mm. uh, OHS um, focus, it's probably a good way mm. to end it because I've in the MSD systems approach model I've pulled everything in. So I think Kelly can show it as well, but I'll give you the, I'll give you the short answer, okay? So this MSG systems approach model, it works together to manage these MSGs in an integrated way. It um, starts off with leadership at the top, which makes sense, so that's that strategic direction. It's about providing what resources we need, that flows through to planning and support, which is sort of at the second level, which ensures um, that effective oper like operations, uh, minimising those risks. And then the next level is worker participation helps align with those actions. And we talked about that in last week's podcast as well with, with the worker. Um, and then finally, that last level, I'll thank you for sharing, um, is that feedback from, you know, like your performance evaluation, um, improvement activities as well. It refines that system. It's sort of like a loop. So lessons learned are then flicked back up into future planning and that leadership de um, decision. So they're all, they all feed into each other essentially. And this um, a model works together to promote, I guess, that continually improvement cycle, you could say. Mm, agreed. Yeah, so it's yeah. funny that it ends on that too. Pardon? Is it funny that it ends on that? Well, that's right. Yeah, that it makes sense. And, look, you can see in the model, um, and Kelly's sharing it if you're watching it, but obviously if you're listening you cannot, but I'm guessing there will be a link in the notes to yep, the check out relevant standard. article. Edition 82, sorry, 72, 72. Goodness, yeah, I was going to say 82. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you'll, <laughs> you'll see, you know, as nerdy as I am, I have looked at the standard and gone, okay, how does this work together? Because obviously it's embedded within ISO 45001, okay? So I'll move forward and just break down each each level and section as well. So. The first and overarching section of the MSD systems approach model is, of course, its leadership and worker participation, which is really important within ISO 45001. Okay, so this is all in clause five. So this leadership and worker participation, it forms this the foundation. This is this is where it all starts. Okay, you could actually throw in clause four there, which is context, which gives us some sort of context, funny enough, for this leadership and worker participation. But essentially that leadership part is the, is the key area. So it's management's commitment and active engagement of workers in actually doing this hazard identification, coming up with some controls that are really important to successfully implement your health and safety you know, activities, um, what what you're implementing and how you're measuring it. So particularly for, remember, our focus is on musculoskeletal disorders or injuries. There's an interaction here. So leadership sort of sets the tone for that 
planning, support and operations. So it makes sure that all of the actions are aligned within the organization's um, OHS objectives and their strategic direction. And then that worker participation ensures that the, um, the, the practical elements are included. So, you know, you've got this high level, okay, strategy objectives, but then the worker participation brings in the practical element. It's theory and practice. So those two combined improve those hazard IDs and the risk assessments and then, of course, the effectiveness of the controls that are put in place. Does that make sense? It does. And I really like that you took a moment there to not just state leadership but emphasise that worker participation. Um, I think involved we again we talked about this last week as you said everything is kind of looping back nicely um having an employee team member a volunteer whatever their role is in the organization responsible for their own safety and that of the others around them and getting them involved in that decision making is only going to benefit your system because us desk dwellers don't know what's happening in the other offices or on the floor or out on the road. So it is really important, as you said, to get that worker participation and encourage and embrace that to get the most out of this. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's the theory side of it because, you know, if we're just sitting at our desk, we, you know, we can guess what the hazards and risks are. But by getting the relevant workers involved, then they're the ones that, that are actually doing it. They know. Hmm. Interesting that um, bring up, we had a conversation, we had our roof um, replaced following storms recently, and we had kind of this conversation around safety equipment, et cetera, with the guys that were actually doing it and the guys that were booking it. And they had very different ideas because, yes, there is recommended and recommended and required safety equipment for working at heights on roof etc and the conversations we had both myself and my other half both work in the audit world um he said yeah we have the required stuff which we will use because that saves our life but the recommended stuff actually hinders our ability to do our job properly it actually creates more hazards etc and those recommendations were implemented by people sitting behind the desk who have never climbed on a roof so if they had engaged the roofers in those conversations they probably would have recommended something different and something more appropriate that the the team members were willing and able to use more effectively, more efficiently and more. Where are the recommendations coming from? The recommendations were coming from the office staff, their OHS oh, okay. well, graduates. Okay. So, yeah. Sorry, non-conformance. Um, yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah, there, there's meant to be, yeah, consultation and participation. So, yeah, um, yeah if, if it came from, from the their, their business, well, yeah. They they should be involved in that process. So yeah, um, yeah if, if they're you complaining about comment. it to you, yeah, if they're complaining about it to you, they need to be complaining about it to whoever's in yeah. the office because they're not involving the right people in the process. Yeah, yeah. So we've learned that. there that they were not engaged, but also your business now has a non-conformance. So yes, <laughs> it's really important <laughs> to engage your workers. Yeah. <laughs> No, um, like, like no, major that's... or minor, Jackie? Major or minor? <laughs> well, I'd have to see what, what it was and how long it's been going on for. You know, it's all about risk, Kelly. Exactly. Pretty sure working <laughs> at heights on a roof is somewhat high risk. Well, Anywho. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that's that main overarching sort of section of that MSD systems approach model. Then underneath we have... A couple of sections we have planning and we have support I'll come back to how they marry together shortly but initially I'll go through that second section of the MSD systems approach model is planning which aligns with ISO 45001 clause 
Six, okay? So planning involves identifying hazards, assessing risks, establishing objectives to manage and prevent MSDs. It requires proactive measures to reduce risks related to, as you mentioned before, ergonomics, manual tasks, and work design. So the interaction with leadership and workers, I guess, it relies on their input, like from that leadership and workers level, to identify the MSD risks and then design the appropriate, we've said interventions, but controls essentially. So it supports the operational, so the implementation, the doing stuff, which is Clause 8, because it provides clear objectives and clear risk management plans. Okay, so that leadership worker participation, as we discussed, theory with that practical element, then because we know what's going on, we can start planning a lot better. Mm. It's interesting that I I feel (laughs) I can relate to a lot of organisations that planned and then engage mm. workers. Oh, I feel yeah. like there's a lot of businesses out yeah. there flipping the flipping the process around because yeah. you can't no, that's a, you can't plan yeah. for the unex the unknown really. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point actually. Um, you know, we at Atoll might fall into that trap sometimes as well because yeah, you just sort of want to get on with it. So no, that's a really good point. So it is about, yeah, the context What's the, the strategy? Where are we heading? Include the workers. Ah, oh, okay, there's the picture. Now what does that look like? How do we move forward? And, you know, you do say that, though, Kelly, but it can be cyclical as well because what you put together in the plan may not actually end up achieving the results that you're looking for. So where do you go? You go back up to leadership and work participation. So I think this is the beauty of this MSD systems approach in in this whole model. While I created it by levels and incorporated everything, it it they all feed into each other. Mm. Yeah? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Okay. So the next section on that second level that goes with planning is the third section of the MSD systems approach model. Um, And as I said, it's on the same level as planning is support. So, and again, this aligns with clause um, clause seven in 45,001. So support includes resources essentially so resources can be training communication um, access to ergonomic tools um, and all this is about enabling workers to carry out conduct their activities safely so this clause in 45001 so clause 7 support ensures that the system is well supported with the right competencies awareness and infrastructure so support enables the operation of the system by providing workers with the knowledge and most importantly the tools needed to safely conduct what they need to perform their tasks. So it interacts with planning by ensuring that adequate resources are available to meet the objectives and then with performance evaluation, which is coming up in the in a final loop, it ensures that ongoing training and resources are available um, as new risks and gaps are identified. So that last bit I just said sort of backed up what I just mentioned to you earlier. As usual, I jump ahead. Mm, we do. Because, yeah, it it is cyclical, okay? we Just because this model uh, is in levels doesn't mean you just stay there and now I'm working here. Oh, no, I can't go back up there. I can't go back down here. Yes, you can. It, they all work together. And particularly with support, um, as I mentioned, it's all about resources. So you've got your plan now. You know how you're moving forward. Based on 
what leadership and your worker participation have identified as your hazards and risks and your assessments and your plan is what your controls are. So to implement this plan, you need stuff to do it, don't you? So Mm. this stuff is resources. So as I always say, it's not just human resources. Yes, that's part of it. And these human resources need to be competent um, and aware of what's going on in the oh space. But it's it's tools, equipment, hardware, software, um, you know, your vehicles, plant, you know, it's everything that you need to, one, do the job, but keep your workers safe as well. So you can see each of these is feeding into each other. One of the tools that we use in this space uh, that I actually really love, and I said it, I had that epiphany a couple of weeks ago when I was reusing it because it's coming around to um, my annual cycle for um, my risk assessment, is the online tools available. Uh, in our case, we use the Queensland Government Working From Home training because it does cover all of these things specific to our working environment and they have them for yes. working from home they have offices um they have work sites as you said that involve plant that don't involve plant so i'm sure that it's not just our state government that offers these resources i'm sure that there's a lot of um other state federal um local governments there will be a lot of safety i don't know organizations that do it um who was i looking at that eh? Um, I was looking for a new chair for my other half the other day and even that website was just, it was a company that specialised in ergonomic chairs because he's had this really fancy looking but really not new, not appropriate chair in his office. <laughs> um, it actually had a questionnaire around height, weight, frequency at your desk, all those sorts of things to make That's sure amazing. that... Yeah, that they were recommending the right chair. He stole my chair because I've got my stool, which worked out cheaper. But I was really fascinated by this That's tool awesome. to make sure that the organisation or the person that was purchasing from this company was really aware of their needs and yeah. making sure that they had um, had appropriate equipment um, and, and supported Yeah, that's very them. clever. I like it. Was. it was. I don't know how yeah. you go buying in bulk, but, yeah, from an individual perspective. It was- <laughs> yeah, that's right. Obviously it's, yeah, for individuals um, mm. to purchase. But you know what? There's a very good point that you made, Kelly. So, mm. you know, when businesses buy chairs in bulk, well, are, are they suitable for all the different workers, height, weight, and, and how they use it? Like it is an individual thing, isn't it? Mm, I love a good mesh chair for hot summer, but I hate a mesh chair for <laughs> support. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, Perfect no, it's example. actually a really good point, yeah, for yeah. us I, desk I dwellers. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend sending a survey out asking all of your staff their height and their weight. That's probably HR. No, might not but it, it does right mean be aware. that possible. But there's their engagement. Like, uh, mm. you know, it might mean that, you're giving the workers their own um, tools to go on and order their own chair. Mm. Like well, it's it, a it, range of options. If if that's not an option, give them a range of options. Exactly. Not just this exactly. chair fits our red colour scheme. Yeah, because otherwise they're just doing a bulk fix for everyone and you know what's going to happen? There's going to be people with sore backs and then they're just going to have to chuck the chairs out and get a new, get a one that suits them anyway. And I've been in that position, where, yeah, when I was an employee many, many years ago. Funny story, I still have the chair and my husband's using it now. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, it was, oh, God, the chair's really quite old. It might be, I'd hate to say how old it is. And they spent a lot of money on getting me this really great chair um, that was ergonomically, um, you know, correct for me and how I worked, et cetera. Um, because, yeah, the chair that they provided, the generic chair, just wasn't cutting it. So why don't they do it straight up? 
Yeah. Time, energy, the less time off at the physio, remedial massage. Absolutely. Yeah. Things. So, yeah, good light bulb moment, Kelly. Look at us go. Ideas. Yeah, we all have uh-huh. them occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> So, I normally this early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so the fourth section of the MSD systems approach model and on the next level down is operation, which aligns with 45,001 clause 8. So operation yeah, is where the plans are actually put into action. You know, we've had a lot of talk so far about planning and then getting the support that we need, the resources, but now we can actually do something with it. So operation focuses on implementing the identified controls to eliminate or reduce the risk. So those ergonomic improvements that we just talked about or any process changes as well. So now we're actually doing something about it because we have the resource to, resources to support our plan. All right. So The operation part of this requires the output from planning and support, so that was sort of all on level two, to be effective, obviously, and then it goes back up to leadership involvement and worker participation. So they guide how these operations are implemented sort of, you know, practically and on the ground. So it's sort of like they're checking as they go. It's it's almost like, oh, We've come up with this. We've got a plan. We've got the resources. Now we're doing it. Is it working? Is it working? Is it working? Okay. Mm -hmm. And, And again, I'm jumping ahead because that leads to possibly the next one. I'm not sure which is which is performance evaluation. Yeah, I think we should jump straight into that because you're right. I think this bottom tier do all blend in really nicely, and I know that exactly. Stop here and have a chat. We're going to have nothing else to say. So let's just keep going. (laughs) So the fifth section of the MSD systems approach model and on the same level as operations is, as I said, performance evaluation. And this aligns with clause nine. So performance evaluation involves monitoring and measuring the system's effectiveness. So, you know, I said earlier with operation, it's like now we're doing it. But our leadership and workers are checking as we go, okay, is it doing what it's meant to have been doing? Is it achieving an effective outcome? Okay, so that feeds nicely into this performance evaluation. So this can include audits, inspections, um, reviews, you can call it whatever you want, assessments to ensure that these preventive measures in place are actually working as they're supposed to be working. So performance evaluation as I said, feeds back into planning, support, leadership, and it highlights the areas for improvement. So this is where it's feeding into improvement. So it identifies where the system is doing well, like what's working, or where these possible gaps or actual gaps are. So that's what feeds into improvement. And that then influences your future planning, which goes back up to clause six, and feeds into the sixth and final section of the MSD systems approach. So I'll I'll lead into that now straight away because it just honestly all all goes together, Kelly. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Let's keep moving. Yeah. So the sixth final section of the MSD systems approach model, and on the same level as operation and performance evaluation is improvement, which I hinted at before, and that's clause 10 in 45001. So improvement ensures that the OHS system oh, I love, continues to evolve, like, and it's responding. I love, I love that word. It's, it's responding because it seems real, like we're actually doing something and it's responding to new risks or, or gaps that you've identified during your checking phase, which is your performance evaluation. It focuses on that continual refinement, you could say, of the processes and controls in place to prevent these MSDs. So improvement, of course, relies on feedback from that performance evaluation, and that drives change. Leadership plays a role as well, of course, in implementing the changes. I want to say that worker participation obviously gives us feedback on that. 
Um, and there's improvements, you know, I don't know, it may might include things like training, which goes back to resources in Clause 7. It could be um, changes in operational procedures, which goes back to Clause 8, or it could go even higher up to um, strategy or objectives, which is around Clause 6. So you can see in that final loop how they all link together. None of them are, you know, oh, what's the right word, soul, independent, the, the, Silo is a good word because that's something that we use in business systems or we try not to use. Um, so, yeah, it, it ensures that they're all working together. None of them are independent of another. The reason I let you merge, let you merge all of those together was because we start with work leadership and worker participation, as you said, and we all get those ideas, have all of that. We plan to how we're going to implement all of those things. We give everybody the tools, we put it into practice and we test it out. Works, doesn't work, or the elephant in the atoll room, something changes. Yes, and absolutely. We've seen that. So we've just both mentioned we now are working on stand up. Uh, standing desks um, and therefore all of the reasons you said we had sore backs all those sorts of things um, but also with um, all of my surgeries last year sitting at a desk was not appropriate mm -hmm. for me we've got a team member who has significant um, back injuries and some other um, ailments and those sorts of things for them those things are ever evolving and if we're not looking at this as you said in that whole cyclical balance and really focusing too on on said points five and six that performance evaluation and improvement everything else becomes redundant like yeah. you're yeah. not thinking about the changes the evolution it's not just a set and forget it does yeah. as we've talked about the last few weeks ohs for some people is really exciting for some people it's really boring and some people we completely <laughs> forget about it because it is or should be part of our everyday. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're not really paying attention to that bottom line there, you're not going to be addressing what you need for the people in the moment. And that's why we do this on an annual cycle or, as you said, when something changes Just, because yes. that's really important. What was appropriate for me 15 months ago is definitely not now yourself you've oh, had boy. your your injury um oh, things yeah. that you could do <laughs> yep. sorry I, Jackie and I were laughing at the beginning because Jackie was bragging about I can just sit at my desk and I can flick on my fan and flick on this and flick on that and flick <laughs> on that that was great when she couldn't move her arm and get up and move around <laughs> she's made some improvements um yes and yeah, that, actually to be problem. honest that that is a change too because I had my shoulder injury, so I was sitting differently. I was standing differently. Um, yeah. So basically, I could moving. I need a whole new left side now <laughs> because it does. And, and you picked up on that with your surgeries last year because it changes your posture, posture. and how you're sitting because you're nursing injuries and yeah, you're standing differently. So yeah, it make it makes a huge difference. Mm. Yeah, so I said, yeah, that's why we we encourage that every time you change your yeah. environment or your situation. Changes. Yeah. yeah, and I like what you said, you said about the bottom line, which is operation, performance, evaluation and improvement is really important, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you know, talk to your workers, leadership can make some decisions with the workers, you can plan it figure out your resources and then do it. And if you just leave it there, you're just doing it, it sort of goes back to your roofers. They're doing it, but they're yeah. complaining about these ridiculous recommendations that have been given to them when they're actually performing the work, which is operation. Hmm. But some, and I'm look, I'm only guessing, they're complaining to you, is it going back up to leadership? And then back to planning yeah. and then back to resources. 
Hmm. And so I, I chuckled then and said something under my breath and my comment was, we passed it on, but we're the client. And yeah, you don't want right. to be hearing from your client or your customer that your staff are complaining or uncomfortable or we, like, they were great and the organisation as a whole were great. They really appreciated that feedback. But that had me questioning whether they had the right culture because exactly. the, it had to come from a client rather than them feeling comfortable enough to have yeah. those conversations themselves. Yeah. So, but then it does go back to, well, were workers um, consulted at the time yeah. as well? And, you know, as I said, I liked how you came to that and said that bottom row is really important. But then when you start talking about it, it goes, well, sorry, it should have been up the top to start with. So that, mm. again, supports what we were saying that these all work together. Yes, you, I, and I, I can go off on a tangent and say, oh, that one's really important. Oh, but hold on. Oh. That means this one's really important too then. So, hmm. yeah, it, it really highlights that they all work together. Yeah. So I suppose will I summarise now? I think yeah. we've sort of yeah. done Unless we that. want to tell any more stories about our inabilities to stand on two feet and fall off chairs and why <laughs> we're now using standing desks. Um, yeah, we managed to avoid those conversations a bit, so let's move on and keep avoiding. We have. We have. So... Just to yeah, summarise or wrap up what Kelly and I have covered is in this um, MSG model that um, we created, so the MSG systems approach model. And, uh, you know, anyone that's looking at it or have just even been listening, you can see that it is honestly, there's no surprises. I have not made up anything groundbreaking. All I do is go to a standard and, and look at it and go, oh, how does that fit into this story? That's simply all I've done. And with that, I've created these different levels. So at level one was that leadership and worker participation, which al aligns with clause five. So that's that overarching um, strategy, objectives, getting the workers' feedback. Then that goes into planning and support at the second level. So now... We've got an idea of what, what our hazards are and what the associated risks and assessments are. Now we can do some planning. What do we need to do to control this and set some objectives? And now we've done that. What resources do we need that support? So people, plant, equipment, tools, hardware, software, all of, all of those sorts of things to then make it happen on level three which is operation, that's implementation. And then when we're doing it, we've got to be checking it. Check, check, check. Is what we set out to achieve, are we doing that now? That's performance evaluation in Clause 9. And all of that feeds into improvement, which is that last section on that third level. And it all loop, loops up. I think the word that I've loved the most today is um, responding. And mm. like when, when I said the word, it felt like really fluid. And this, this is what that, this process should be. It's, it's really fluid. Everything feeds into each other. Okay. So as always, before I hand it back to Kelly, I'd like to close with stay curious because you know I love that word. And always lead the standard. By staying curious and leading the standard, you'll continually find new opportunities for growth and excellence in your career. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, today, my big takeaway, yeah, I love that responsive as well. And it, it is all about weaving uh, safety into everyday Ooh. work and Ooh, like getting that. everyone involved in finding those solutions right from the start, not after things go wrong or once you hit that third row. So not necessarily a blanket solution for the whole team, but also ones that are unique and suited to them as individuals. So, um, yeah, that was my key takeaway for today. Um, that is a wrap for today's episode of Lead the Standard. Uh, before we do go, a little teaser for next week. I'm really, really looking forward to that. I say it every week, but this one is going to be really interesting. Um, episode 26, I had to do some counting then. It's all about trends 
insights and career opportunities for 2025. We all know it's coming to the end of the year and we're getting a little bit sick of a couple of things here and there and some people could be looking for a change, a new year, new career maybe. So we'll be looking ahead at what's coming up in the auditing, uh, safety, ISO, quality, all of those things world. You do not want to miss that episode. Um, thank you for hanging out with us today. Remember, as always, do keep leading the standard and we will catch you next week.